You are listening to Trash Radio. Seventh President of the United States, born on the 15th of March, 1767, at the Warsaw Settlement in Union County, North Carolina, or in Lancaster County, South Carolina, to where his parents had immigrated from Carrickfergus, Ireland, in 1765. He played a slight part in the War of Independence and was taken prisoner in 1781, his treatment resulting in a lifelong dislike for Great Britain. He studied law at Salisbury, North Carolina, was admitted to the bar there in 1787, and began to practice at McLeansville, Guilford County, North Carolina, where for a time he was a constable and deputy sheriff. In 1788, having been appointed prosecuting attorney of the Western District of North Carolina, now the state of Tennessee, he removed to Nashville, the seat of justice of the district. In 1791, he married Mrs. Rachel Robards, having heard that her husband had obtained a divorce through the legislature of Virginia. The legislative act, however, had only authorized the courts to determine whether or not there were sufficient grounds for divorce and to grant or withhold it accordingly. It was more than two years before the divorce was actually granted and only on the basis of the fact that Jackson and Mrs. Robards were living together. On receiving this information, Jackson had the marriage ceremony performed a second time. In 1796, Jackson assisted in framing the Constitution of Tennessee from December 1796 to March 1797. He represented that state in the Federal House of Representatives, where he distinguished himself as an irreconcilable opponent of President George Washington and was one of 12 representatives who voted against the address to him by the House. In 1797, he was elected a United States Senator, but he resigned in the following year. He was judge of the Supreme Court of Tennessee from 1798 to 1804. In 1804 to 1805, he contracted a friendship with Aaron Burr, and at the latter's trial in 1807, Jackson was one of his conspicuous champions. Up to the time of his nomination for the presidency, the biographer of Jackson finds nothing to record but military exploits in which he displayed perseverance, energy, and skill of a very high order and a succession of personal acts in which he showed himself ignorant, violent, perverse, quarrelsome, and astonishingly indiscreet. His combative disposition led him into numerous personal difficulties. In 1795, he fought a duel with Colonel Waitstill Avery, an opposing counsel, over some angry words uttered in a courtroom, but both, it appears, intentionally fired wild. In 1806, in another duel, after a long and bitter quarrel, he killed Charles Dickinson, and Jackson himself received a wound from which he never fully recovered. In 1813, he exchanged shots with Thomas Hart Benton and his brother, Jesse, in a Nashville tavern, 
and received a second wound. Jackson and Thomas Hart Benton were later reconciled. In 1813 to 1814, as Major General of Militia, he commanded in the campaign against the Creek Indians in Georgia and Alabama, defeated them at Talladega on the 9th of November, 1813, and at Tohopeka on the 29th of March, 1814, and thus first attracted public notice by his talents. In May, 1814, he was commissioned as Major General in the regular army to serve against the British. In November, he captured Pensacola, Florida, then owned by Spain, but used by the British as a base of operations. And on the 8th of January, 1815, he inflicted a severe defeat on the enemy before New Orleans, the contestants being unaware that a treaty of peace had already been signed. During his stay in New Orleans, he proclaimed martial law and carried out his measures with unrelenting sternness, banishing from the town a judge who attempted resistance. When civil law was restored, Jackson was fined $1,000 for contempt of court. In 1844, Congress ordered the fine with interest to be repaid. In 1818, Jackson received the command against the Seminoles. His conduct in following them up into British, excuse me, Spanish territory of Florida, in seizing Pensacola, and in arresting and executing two British subjects, Alexander Arbuthnot and Robert Ambrister, gave rise to much hostile comment in the cabinet and in Congress. But the negotiations for the purchase of Florida put to an end the diplomatic difficulty. In 1821, Jackson was military governor of the territory of Florida. And there again, he came into collision with the civil authority. From this, as from previous troubles, John Quincy Adams, then Secretary of State, extricated him. In July 1822, the General Assembly of Tennessee nominated Jackson for president, and in 1823, he was elected to the United States Senate, from which he resigned in 1825. The rival candidates for the office of president in the campaign of 1824 were Jackson, John Quincy Adams, William H. Crawford, and Henry Clay. Jackson obtained the largest number of votes, 99, in the Electoral College. Adams receiving 84, Crawford 41, and Clay 37. But no one had an absolute majority, and it thus became the duty of the House of Representatives to choose one of the three candidates Adams, Jackson, and Crawford, who had received the greatest number of electoral votes. At the election by the House, February 9th, 1825, Adams was chosen, receiving the votes of 13 states, while Jackson received the votes of seven, and Crawford the votes of four. Jackson however, was recognized by the abler politicians as the coming man. Van Buren and others going into opposition under his banner waged from the first a relentless and factious war on the administration. Van Buren was the most adroit politician of his time, 
and Jackson was in the hands of very astute men who advised and controlled him. He was easy to lead when his mind was in solution and he gave his confidence freely where he had once placed it. He was not suspicious, but if he withdrew his confidence, he was implacable. When his mind crystallized on a notion that had a personal significance to him, that notion became a hard fact that filled his field of vision. When he was told that he had been cheated in the matter of the presidency, he was sure of it, although those who told him were by no means so. There was great significance in the election of Jackson in 1828. A new generation was growing up under new economic and social conditions. They felt great confidence in themselves and great independence. They despised tradition and the old world ways and notions, and they accepted the Jeffersonian dogmas, not only as maxims, but as social forces, the causes of the material prosperity of the country. By this generation, therefore, Jackson was recognized as a man after their own heart. They liked him because he was vigorous, brusque, uncouth, relentless, straightforward, and open. They made him president in 1828, and he fulfilled all their expectations. He had 178 votes in the Electoral College against 83 given for Adams. Though the work of redistribution of offices began almost at his inauguration, it is yet an incorrect account of the matter to say that Jackson corrupted the civil service. His administration is rather the date at which a system of democracy, organized by the use of patronage, was introduced into the federal arena by Van Buren. It was at this time that the Democratic or Republican party divided, largely along personal lines, into Jacksonian Democrats and National Republicans, the latter led by such men as Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams. The administration itself had two factions in it from the first. The faction of Van Buren, the Secretary of State, in 1829 to 1831, and that of John C. Calhoun, Vice President, in 1829 to 1832. The refusal of the wives of the cabinet and of Mrs. Calhoun to accord social recognition to Margaret O'Neill Eaton brought about a rupture, and in April 1831, the whole cabinet was reorganized. Van Buren, a widower, sided with the president in this affair and grew in his favor. Jackson, in the meantime, had learned that Calhoun, as Secretary of War, had wished to censure him for his actions during the Seminole War in Florida in 1818, and henceforth he regarded the South Carolina statesman as his enemy. The result was that Jackson transferred to Van Buren his support for succession in the presidency. The relations between Jackson and his cabinet were unlike those existing under his predecessors. Having a military point of view, he was inclined to look upon the cabinet members as inferior officers. And when in need of advice, he usually consulted a group of personal friends 
who came to be called the Kitchen Cabinet. The principal members of this clique were William B. Lewis, Amos Kendall, and Duff Green, the last named being an editor of the United States Telegraph, the organ of the administration. In 1832, Jackson was re-elected by a large majority, 219 electoral votes to 41, over Henry Clay, his chief opponent. The battle raged mainly around the re-charter of the Bank of the United States. It is probable that Jackson's advisors in 1828 had told him, though erroneously, that the bank had worked against him and then were not able to control him. The first message of his first presidency had contained a severe reflection on the bank. And in the very height of this second campaign, July 1832, he vetoed the recharter, which had been passed in the session of 1831 to 1832. Jackson interpreted his re-election as an approval by the people of his war on the bank, and he pushed it with energy. In September 1833, he ordered the public deposits in the bank to be transferred to selected local banks and entered upon the experiment whether these could not act as fiscal agents for the government and whether the desire to get the deposits would not induce the local banks to adopt sound rules of currency. During the next session, the Senate passed a resolution condemning his conduct. Jackson protested, and after a hard struggle in which Jackson's friends were led by Senator Thomas Hart Benton, the resolution was ordered to be expunged from the record on the 16th of January, 1837. In 1832, when the state of South Carolina attempted to nullify the tariff laws, Jackson at once took steps to enforce the authority of the federal government, ordering two war vessels to Charleston and placing troops within convenient distance. He also issued a proclamation warning the people of South Carolina against the consequences of their conduct. In the troubles between Georgia and the Cherokee Indians, however, he took a different stand. Shortly after his first election, Georgia passed an act extending over the Cherokee country the civil laws of the state. This was contrary to the rights of the Cherokees under a federal treaty, and the Supreme Court consequently declared the act void in 1832. Jackson, however, having the frontiersman contempt for the Indian, refused to enforce the decision of the court. Jackson was very successful in collecting old claims against various European nations for spoliations inflicted under Napoleon's continental system especially the French spoliation claims, which reference to which he acted with aggressiveness and firmness. Aiming at a currency to consist largely of specie, he caused the payment of these claims to be received and imported as specie as far as possible. And in 1836, he ordered land agents to receive for land nothing but specie. About the same time, a law passed Congress for distributing among the states 
some $35 million balance belonging to the United States. The public debt having all been paid. The 80 banks of deposit in which it was lying had regarded this sum almost as a permanent loan and had inflated credit on the basis of it. The necessary calling in of their loans in order to meet the drafts in favor of the states, combining with the breach of the overstrained credit between America and Europe and the decline in the price of cotton brought about a crash which prostrated the whole financial, industrial, and commercial system of the country for six or seven years. The crash came just as Jackson was leaving office. The whole burden fell on his successor, Van Buren. In the 18th century, the influences at work in the American colonies developed democratic notions. In fact, the circumstances were those which create equality of wealth and condition, as far as civilized men ever can be equal. The War of Independence was attended by a grand outburst of political dogmatism of the democratic type. A class of men were produced who believed in very broad dogmas of popular power and rights. There were a few rich men, but they were almost ashamed to differ from their neighbors, and in some cases they endorsed democracy in order to win popularity. After the 19th century began the class of rich men rapidly increased. In the first years of the century, a little clique at Philadelphia became alarmed at the increase of what they called the money power and at the growing perils to democracy. They attacked with some violence, but little skill, the first bank of the United States, and they prevented its recharter. The most permanent interest of the history of the United States is the picture it offers of a primitive democratic society transformed by prosperity and the acquisition of capital into a great Republican Commonwealth. The denunciations of the money power and the reiteration of democratic dogmas deserve earnest attention. They show the development of classes or parties in the old undifferentiated masses. Jackson came upon the political stage just when a wealthy class first existed. It was industrial and commercial class greatly interested in the tariff and deeply interested also in the then current forms of issue banking. The southern planters were also rich, but were agriculturalists and remained philosophical Democrats. Jackson was a man of low birth uneducated, prejudiced, and marked by strong personal feeling in all his beliefs and disbeliefs. He showed in his military work and in his early political doings great lack of discipline. The proposal to make him president won his assent and awakened his ambition. In anything which he undertook, he always wanted to carry his point, almost regardless of incidental effects on himself or others. He soon became completely enraged in the effort to be made president. The men nearest to him understood his character and played on it. It was suggested to him that the money power was against him, and that meant that to the educated or cultivated class of that day, 
he did not seem to be in the class from which a president should be chosen. He took the idea that the Bank of the United States was leading the money power against him and that he was the champion of the masses of democracy and of the common people. The opposite party, led by Clay, Adams, Biddle, etc., had schemes for banks and tariffs, enterprises which were open to severe criticism. The political struggle was very intense, and there were two good sides to it. Men like Thomas Hart Benton, Edward Livingston, Amos Kendall, and the Southern statesmen found material for strong attacks on the Whigs. The great mass of voters felt the issue at Jackson's managers stated it. That meant that the masses recognized Jackson as their champion. Therefore, Jackson's personality and name became a power on the side opposed to banks, corporations, and other forms of the new growing power of capital. That Jackson was a typical man of his generation is certain. He represents the spirit and temper of the free American of that day. And it was a part of his way of thinking and acting that he put his whole life and interest into the conflict. He accomplished two great things of importance in United States history. He crushed excessive state rights and established the contrary doctrine in fact and in political orthodoxy of the Democrats. He destroyed the great bank. The subsequent history of the bank left it without an apologist and prejudiced the whole later judgment about it. The way in which Jackson accomplished these things was such that it cost the country 10 years of the severest liquidation and left conflicting traditions of public policy in the Democratic Party. After he left Washington, Jackson fell into discord with his most intimate old friends and turned his interest to the cause of slavery, which he thought to be attacked and in danger. Jackson is one of the few presidents of whom it may be said that he went out of office far more popular than he was when he entered. When he went into office, he had no political opinions, only some popular notions. He left his party strong, perfectly organized, and enthusiastic on a platform of low expenditure, payment of the debt, and no expenditure for public improvement or for glory or display in any form and low taxes. His name still remained a spell to conjure with, and the politicians sought to obtain his assistance of his approval for their schemes. But, in general, his last years were quiet and uneventful. He died at his residence, the Hermitage, near Nashville, Tennessee, on the 8th of June, 1845. Hey, you. No, not you. The other you. Anatomy of the Heads is the best band you're not listening to right now. What you need to do is go to aoftheh.com. You're welcome. As of recording this, 
television has been the most powerful programming tool utilized in history. Passively receiving predetermined content, adhering to a schedule, these turned everyone into children's society, content to watch the spectacle and try to keep it up. The family unit was slowly dismantled under the guise of freedom and independence. And no, I'm not interested in your argument against this because it's wrong and you need to move on. This was an engineered push to destroy any anti-state support structures. But it takes two to tango, and the boomers were more than willing to buy into fantasies that inflated their egos. They didn't need to raise their children. That was what schools were for. They didn't need to take care of their children past 18. This is America, and independence is what we worship. I look around at the boomers, and they are a sorry lot. They lived their entire lives as consumer tourists, never investing in anything, never building or growing anything of their own. And if they did manage, it was to save up for their retirement. Although, let's be honest, most just cashed in on the housing bubble, fueled by the Federal Reserve and those who gained from speculating on it. They don't really have any reason to live, except to consume and travel. They end up wasting most of their savings and retirements constantly chasing a lifestyle they never reach because they can't be young again. And the happiness that was promised to them by all the commercials just isn't there. They continue to spend more and more money to prolong their lives, which they use just to watch more TV, leaving nothing behind for their children or grandchildren. Boomers sit in their nice houses while you scrounge with roommates, and they blame you for the destruction of this world. William Gibson once said that the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. Well, the good news is, he's right. But the bad news is, we live in a cyberpunk dystopia without all the cool stuff. Let's take a look, shall we? We're starting with the economy bankrupt states, collapse of the U.S. economy, drastic increase of essential commodities prices, famines, meta-national corporations without a fixed country, and takeover of food production by states and megacorporations. The environment, climate changes, depletion of global resources, massive animal die-offs, in particular birds and fish, depletion of oil resources, dwindling supplies of drinking water, ecocide, and multiplication of large-scale natural disasters. Well, other disasters as well, if you're familiar at all with what's happening in East Palestine, Ohio at the moment. 
geopolitics, balkanization, balkanization of the United States and other countries, countries serving as data banks to skirt international law, exacerbation of nationalism, internal destabilization of China, resource wars, severe strengthening of borders by rich countries to fight off immigration, undermining of U.S. hegemony, and the demonization of nationalism that is popping up around the globe. Social. Abandonment of any kind of social welfare, blood sports, brainwashing and deceiving of the masses through mass media, control of society by powerful mega corporations, disappearance of any criticism against the excesses of society disappearance of the middle class, disappearance of social ties and community, drugs more or less legal and massively distributed and consumed, emergence of many sects and other religious fanatics, emergence of nomads, Epidemics and pandemics. Frenzied urbanization and emergence of giant megalopuses. Growing technology gap and emergence of a low tech population. Lawlessness in urban areas. A mass exodus from every city partly due to pricing, non-education of the people, meaning privatization of education, thus reserved only for the wealthy, power increase of criminal cartels, the press entirely controlled by states and mega corporations private polices and armies, puppet states controlled by mega corporations, rich poor abyssal disparity, riots and uprising violently repressed, violent confrontation between states and criminal cartels, and collusion between states and criminal cartels. Technology, artificial intelligence and advanced computing, brain machine interface, control and surveillance of society by all possible technological means. Cybernetics, Cyber warfare, early colonization of the solar system, electromagnetic and futuristic weapons, exoskeletons, info wars, internet everywhere, nano and biotechnologies. Permanent connection to the net and virtual or augmented reality. And last but not least, and not entirely pigeonholed to just what comes out of DARPA and MIT, robotics. You know, people only change when they have no choice.
the catchphrase, the earth is on fire, is cute. But until the earth is actually burning, then one option is to get used to that status quo. You too can help keep it in place with any number of distractions. Culture war is quite popular these days. Dear Diary, I have to piss. I can think of nothing else anymore. This has been going on for far longer than anyone would be able to endure. And yet, I do. I persist. I continue. I have killed three dragons, rescued countless maidens, found more treasure than I could ever have imagined, and all these accomplishments count for nothing, because I cannot enjoy any of it. I spend all my free time trying to comprehend why it is that this has happened to me. It feels as though there is some unseen force controlling my actions. And this particular unseen force seems to have forgotten that I am a human being and have bodily functions. I am treated no better than an animal, and yet an animal may urinate as and where he pleases. I am afforded no such luxury, for luxury it would surely be the sweet glory and relief of letting that golden stream fly. Oh, God, I must not think about it, or I would surely weep. No matter where I go, no matter what I do, I seem to have every adventure possible, except for the one I yearn for so much, an adventure to the privy. It is not to be, apparently, yet I eat, I drink, I have gone to more fucking taverns in the last handful of months alone than anyone ever goes to in their entire goddamned life, and at every single one, I seem to meet someone important. What the hell? And in that time... Oh, the beer I have drunk. Suspiciously, I have not actually gotten intoxicated. Not once. And yet, I drink. So, so much. More mugs of beer than I could ever recount. And not once have I relieved myself. I feel as though I am going to explode. And yet, impossibly, I live on. Today, one of my teammates was killed. A childhood friend of mine, whose parents for some reason named him Ravenwood Blade. A retarded name, to be sure, but no less so than the rest of my teammates. He was killed. I could not weep. I shed no tears. In fact, deep down, I feel good. I envy him. I know that he has gone to his final reward, where no doubt he is piddling up a storm. If only I were so lucky. I no longer desire to live. All I want is to take a piss. While I'm at it, I really have to shit. In Fallout 3, you have Little Lamplight and Big Town. These are nothing but tropes pretending to be world Little Lamplight is the worst offender, considering how it only makes sense if the war happened a year or less ago. 
And these kids were stranded in a cave when they took shelter from the bombing with their teachers. The Brotherhood of Steel being present in Fallout 3 could be acceptable. Their behavior can't. Knights in shining armor are not what the Brotherhood of Steel is, but that's what they're presented as. Why? Because Bethesda can't make a game without using black and white morality and an organization of elite warriors to join to save the world. Even the Garden of Eden creation kit was a MacGuffin done wrong. It's shown in Fallout 2 that it was a suitcase of seeds to replant and restart civilization. Not a magical device that can create life which even if it was, using it as a water filter has got to be the dumbest thing ever. Contrary to most people, I get the idea about that game's plot being entirely surrounding the water purifier. It's a nod to the first game, where water plays an important role to hook the player and the factions aren't all fighting to turn it on. They are fighting for controlling a very important asset that can ensure supremacy over the DC wasteland and beyond. However, it's still a cookie cutter black and white story with the option of being a dick because violence is funny, haha and it takes the entire central plot of the game when in the first, it was but the first hook into something far more serious. It violates the idea of what the Garden of Eden creation kit is. It paints the Brotherhood of Steel and the Enclave in a completely wrong way, and it doesn't even make sense considering Megaton's water purifier, or even Harold. Fallout 4 is even worse. The Institute alone takes the fucking cake here. Session 1. Had first meeting with M today. He seems, on the whole, a well-adjusted young man. Unsure why he seeks therapy. Today's session was mostly introductory. Session 2. M has had some rough luck, as he fell into a vat of chemicals while at work this week. The chemicals were mostly an untested mix of this thing and that, left uncovered and with a catwalk above it. My suggestion that he discuss this with OSHA fell largely on deaf ears. Session 3 I feel that M is having a difficult time dealing with traumatic experiences, though it is perfectly understandable that his incident at work would remind him of his own mortality, and as such the murder of his father when he was younger, he has become perhaps unhealthily fixated on the growing crime rate of the city in which he lives. It would also appear that his former co-worker, Dr. X, has been exhibiting self-destructive behavior and also signs of projection as he blames the company he was fired earlier this year for testing new formula on himself, for his being ostracized from most social circles. I suggested to M that perhaps Dr. X would do well to seek therapy himself, although I am not accepting new patients at this time, I would certainly be able to refer him. 
Session 4. M has externalized his abandonment issues and his social conscience in a way that I did not see coming. It appears that the accident at work left him with the ability to shoot beams out of his hands, fly, and repel bullets. His first reaction to this, I am led to believe, was a compulsion to put on pantyhose and a cape and beat up muggers. Perhaps his violent outbursts are his way of rebelling against societal conditioning. Maybe it's repressed transvestitism? I am unsure how to broach the subject during our meetings. Session 5. It would seem that Dr. X has obtained abilities similar to those of M and is terrorizing the populace. The two men have come to blows several times, yet there has been no closure. My current speculation is that both men are attempting, in counterproductive ways, to cope with repressed homosexual urges. I am told that Dr. X was also possessed by the urge to put on women's hosiery. This seems pretty cut and dried to me. Two grown males dress up in women's underthings and crawl all over each other in public. What is so complicated about this? Session 6 M is now dealing with the accidental death of his girlfriend. His attempts to cope have been surprisingly focused and effective. He is progressing through the accepted stages of loss normally. Perhaps there is hope. Session 7 As it turns out, his girlfriend was never really dead. The being that he believed to be his girlfriend was in fact an alien clone constructed by the alien overlord Z to gain his trust. This has upset the coping process greatly, though he was, and is, relieved. Session 8 M is deeply troubled that he must fight a parallel universe clone of himself to save the world. I suggested talking his differences out with the clone. I am pretty sure he didn't listen. Session 9 M and I have agreed to part company. I do not feel that he is willing to make any progress and I cannot help someone who does not want to be helped. The old joke about shrinks and light bulbs applies here, I feel, more than ever. This is probably all for the best. The outline of his penis, plainly visible, was growing more unsettling by the week. The majority of homicides go unsolved in a growing number of major American cities, an alarming trend that has worsened significantly during the last 20 years. 73 major police and sheriff's departments reported to the FBI that they failed to make an arrest in most of the homicides they investigated this year. This means thousands of killers still walk the streets for homicides they committed in major urban areas like Albuquerque, Baltimore, Boston, Cincinnati, 
Cleveland, Atlanta's DeKalb County, Houston, Indianapolis, Kansas City, Memphis, New Orleans, and St. Louis. Nearly 6,000 homicides went undeclared in 2019, and it's only gotten worse since. Stop and think about last year. If I had to wager a most morbid bet, the number of undeclared homicides has only climbed since. Considering the permanent digital footprint people now leave behind, unless they're Amish, or pretty much removed from society. It's incredible that serial killers are still out there. Three years ago, a suspect in Chicago was arrested for the murder of 51 women, all strangled. Chicago police arrested Arthur Hilliard and charged him with the homicide of Diamond Turner the first arrest to be made among a large cluster of 51 female strangulations on Chicago's south and west sides. The cluster was identified by a computer algorithm developed by the Murder Accountability Project. Murderdata.org is a site trying to find at-large serial killers. Murderdata.org is a site trying to find at-large serial killers. Consider how many crimes have slipped through the cracks since 2020 when Chinese lung herpes became both the foreground and background of so much that has unfolded before our eyes and against what I can only hope is your comprehension and mine. I saw a homicide detective give a talk on serial killers once at a university. In a city with a population of about one million, he said there are between 20 and 30 guys on the verge of becoming serial killers. It's easy for killers to get away with killing prostitutes because no one reports if a prostitute goes missing and the police give it a low priority. Because if someone with a regular job, friends, and a family gets murdered, police give it a higher priority. People with little value to society, the prostitutes, Clinton campaign staffers, rent boys used by senators and congressmen, they all get low priority. So the homicide detective said in a city of one million, about 20 to 30 guys regularly commit violence against prostitutes. Pimps already commit violence against prostitutes Prostitutes are trained not to report violence to the police. And those 20 to 30 guys are escalating violence against prostitutes. Any one of them might start killing soon. Serial killers fight a profile. White guys from the suburbs. So never trust a white guy from the suburbs. What he didn't say is how many of them statistically become serial killers. Nor did he say what the police do about those guys. They have a pretty good idea who those guys are. But if the prostitutes won't press charges or testify, there's not much the police can do. A pimp would never let any of his girls testify. But if they did, the prostitute would then have access to legal and social services. So almost, in a way, serial killers can get away with violence like beating and cutting. Prostitutes 
almost seemingly with impunity. It's a very vicious cycle. Take a look at the clearance rate in a city near you over at murderdata.org. Time is a flat circle, so I'm not sure if we're in the late 70s or early 80s redux, but it fits the bill. White flight, government shenanigans at home and abroad, biblical levels of avarice, a global pandemic, drugs materializing across the country as if someone wants it there. You know how Black Lives Matter looted Pride Month back in 2020 and suddenly signs mushroomed from the void reminding you that black trans lives matter? They never mention who puts them at risk. Or black lives in general. Relax. I won't reach for FBI crime statistics, but maybe murderdata.org is indicative of black-on-black -black crime. There is a serial killer in Long Island who murdered at least 10 victims between 1996 and 2010. Possibly more authorities haven't discovered yet. Between 2005 and 2009, the bodies of eight women between the ages of 17 to 30 were found dumped in the swamps of Jefferson Davis Parish near Jennings, Louisiana. The West Mesa Bone Collector was narrowed down to two suspects. However, one of them is in prison on an unrelated charge and the other is dead. Lorenzo Montoya lived in a trailer a few miles from where the victims were found, but was killed in 2006 by a sex worker and most likely his next victim. Joseph Blee was a known rapist in the area and when police invaded his home, they found a stash of women's jewelry and underwear. Oh yeah, and those 45 college-aged males across a 20-year span that drowned after getting intoxicated in 11 different states. Smiley faces were found spray-painted near the scene of 12 of the drownings. Date rape drugs were found in the systems of some of the victims, enough to render them completely unconscious. The victim profile is very similar in every case. Male, white, athletic, successful, popular. In the world outside America, there's someone in Carapicubia, Brazil, who killed 12 gay guys execution style with bullets to the head and beat one to death. And in a decrepit building within the Ibadan forest in Nigeria, there were 20 rotten corpses, severed heads, and 10 live people chained to slaughter benches. Pedro Lopez the Danilovsky maniac, and presumably whoever killed 12 and injured 35 by paracot poisoning in Hiroshima back in 1985 are still out there. There are unspeakable acts of violence being committed as you listen to this, hidden from the panopticon we all live within that will go unsolved. This raises dozens of questions I'm not sure anyone is prepared to answer, let alone entertain long enough to provide something resembling an answer to how. Ed Kemper turned himself in and helped update the mental assessment test he outwitted before released back to society 
after serving time in San Quentin for killing his grandparents. Ted Bundy helped the FBI catch the Green River Killer. Sure, time might be a flat circle, but some things have been long overdue. You know when you watch an older movie and the people on screen aren't flawless creatures hatched in pods who don't look like anyone you know? Well, the Trash Radio Patreon is like the internet talkity-talk version of that, so come on down.